Okay, are we ready? I think we're ready. Are we sitting comfortably? I am. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll sit down for this one. Okay. I didn't read the small print, but I agreed to do a Mardicon. <laughs> and I had no idea I was doing a panel. It wasn't until about 10 days ago I suddenly realised I was doing two panels. This made me sort of put together quite quickly. But anyway, I think you'll, I hope you'll enjoy it. And the title is The Good Old Days. Um, like all my lecture titles, it gives you no clues about what I'm actually going to be talking about. But I chose it because some of you with suitable memories will remember the Good Old Days television show, which was filmed by the BBC in Leeds. Which of course is where I come from. On TV, it looked fantastic. In the real world, this is it. It's down a grotty little side street <laughs> next to McDonald's. <laughs> Uh, the inside, uh, that's the best picture I could find. Uh, it, I, I'm doing it a disservice. It has been refurbished since then, but still, to be honest, it doesn't look anything like as good as it does on the telly. Uh, you remember the audience all in Edwardian clothes or whatever. They were Edwardian clothes from the waist up. <laughs> <laughs> BBC didn't care what they were wearing from the waist down. They could be in an Edwardian dress, they could be wearing nothing at all. Didn't matter, we didn't show on camera. It's a lot it more comfortable like that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very small theatre. It really is quite cramped. Um, it's hard to tell, but the actual stall seating is not really rigid. It's, it's pretty flat. Mm -hmm. So to cope with that, the stage is raked. Whoa. <laughs> and it, it's a brilliant theatre to go to to see someone who's never performed there before. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not plays because they rehearse, but if there's anybody I like vaguely musically and they're coming, and it says in the programme, well, their first trip to the Leeds Varieties, I mean, mate, I mean, because it is absolutely brilliant. My favourite one was a chap trying to look all cool, sat on a bar stool playing the guitar, and every so often having to go, to stop his amp rolling down into the audience. <laughs> John Williams. No, no, not that cool, I'm afraid. But anyway, um, so, the good old days. What were the good old days? If you've ever watched the Academy Awards, you'll know they always have this section. To those we have lost this year. Oh, so I got wondering about, about the good old days and what, what have I lost from the good old days? As a, as a doctor in the 21st century, what have I lost from... Now I say 100 years ago, and all the time I was writing this, I was saying 100 years ago. But then there's a small problem about 100 years. Well, it's not a problem, but the thing is, on the outside, I may look 56, but on the inside, I'm 12. <laughs> and my mental calendar stopped, therefore, in 1968. So as far as I'm concerned, 100 years ago is the mid-1800s. So I'm talking about, roughly speaking, the mid-1800s. That, that's the period. What would a doctor practicing in those days have had the opportunity to see and to diagnose that I'm missing out on? Smallpox? Well, maybe. Who knows? Maybe that's one of the ones I've chosen. This is our first dearly departed. Variola Major. Born, uh, we've, it's a bit of a guess, 10,000 BC. You're quite right, this is smallpox. Um, it's a bit difficult to be absolutely sure because smallpox doesn't particularly affect the bones. It's a disease of the skin and the respiratory system, and it therefore doesn't leave a lot <coughs> in the archaeological records. Not, not brilliantly. Uh, it, uh, so born 10,000 BC, died October 26, 1977. Uh, died again just under a year later. <laughs> <laughs> and had a damn good try at having another go in 2004, which uh, we will work through. Smallpox, most people in this room, I'm going to bet, Shall I do my Psychic Sally impression? Psychic Sally, what a Psychic Sally trick, all, all psychics, when they're doing a cold reading, is to suggest injuries. So they'll say, for example, to, to a decent sized room, this room's gonna be this, a decent sized room, uh, I, I'm getting a message from somebody, somebody whose grandfather uh, or grandparent had lost a finger in an industrial injury. And you think, well, that's pretty specific, but people's grandparents were talking about 150 years ago, and industrial accidents, <laughs> losing tips of digits, were astonishingly familiar. In fact, when I was a, a, a house officer, my boss told me about 
patient he saw, he was a, a senior registrar, uh, about two patients, they were actually, it turned out eventually they were father and son. So they had, they had the same name, they had the same address. And they both had lung cancer. And for a considerable period of time, he and his boss were seeing them, <coughs> thinking it was the same patient, it was one set of notes. Because they, they were both missing the tip of, of, the, of a finger from, from mining injuries, Yorkshire in those days having a, having a mining industry. And it was when the, when the consultant said, oh, ho, 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 you got your history wrong. You said he was missing his tip of his index finger, and it's actually the tip of his middle finger. So next to him, checks. So these things, these things are quite common. Uh, hmm? Didn't they even know You would hope so, wouldn't you? <laughs> Didn't worry about getting to their medication twice as well. So. Yeah. Um, <coughs> but anyway, so that, that's one of the, the cold call tricks. The other is a scar on the knee. Everybody's got a scar. So if I was to split this room into, into group A and B, I would go to group A, group A, group B, B, group A, group A, group A. And if I've got this right, I'm going to say that group A, my prediction is, you all have a scar of the size of a five pence piece on the upper outer side of your left arm. The group B people don't. And if I've got this right, the group A people are all going, well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> and the group B people are all thinking, where the what now? What, what's going on? Because of course, I, I'm talking about smallpox vaccination. You know, those of us who've been through it have got by now, a fading scar. The smallpox. Uh, is that I remember in group B and have a scar because I was vaccinated in 1976 or 7, because I went to Zimbabwe. Ah, right. Yes. He was a carrier. Um, <laughs> smallpox. It's, it's, it's one of our sort of ooboo-boo diseases that, that we, you know, we have to talk about. Indeed, it was, it was terrible. <laughs> but, it, but it was called the smallpox. And the reason it was called the smallpox was to distinguish it from the much more serious great pox, syphilis. <laughs> syphilis, was, syphilis was regarded as a much more serious illness <coughs> than smallpox. <laughs> Astonishing as it may seem. Smallpox, generally speaking, it either killed you or it didn't. There was sort of no halfway house. Okay, if you're in the one that dies, you probably regard that as quite serious. But if you're the half that survives, you know, okay, these things happen. You know? Whereas Syphilis was a chronic, debilitating injury which gave you miscarriages, stillbirth, deformed children. There is a pattern, the name of which now escapes me, and I did mean to look it up, in which a woman will have three or four miscarriages, followed by three or four children who die in infancy, followed by three or four sickly children, and then eventually start having healthy children. And that's the pattern of syphilis in, in a woman in childbearing years and <coughs> in the times. Um, in England, Europe, sorry, but the, the, the non-colonies that were, the, the, the old world, smallpox, most people who got it survived. It was, it was serious, but it wasn't a, a, an absolute, you know, 100% fatal killer. There was some population immunity. Most survived, often with, with facial scars. Um, a couple of pictures. These two are relatively recent from India, I think these are from the 50s. Chap over there from the 30s. And the one at the bottom left is a mummy about 3,000 years old. So we, we, we know for sure it was around. Uh, is that 3,000 years old or 3,000 BC? I can't remember. Who's enough of an Egyptologist to tell me when mummification was widely practiced? Mummification was practiced up till the Roman era. Yeah, how far back? Oh, could oh, that be 3,000 BC? Well, in that case, I'm going to say confidently that it's 3,000 BC, because that is the way of the lecturer. Right? <laughs> you say things with confidence, and then you check them afterwards. Anyway, <laughs> uh, but it killed a lot of people. We all know that the, the Spanish took it to South America in the, in the 16th century, killed, as it says there, a quarter of a million people. Outbreaks in North America killed about a third or a half of the native populations to whom they were exposed. It was much, much more serious disease in these um, naive populations is the phrase we use. They didn't have any inherent immunity, whereas the Western society has some the people who are susceptible <coughs> having been filtered out in, in previous generations. So those were the genetic predisposition to 
some resistance <coughs> make up the Western, but the, the, the old world population, the new world population. Uh, as, as recently as 1830, half the native Alaskans were wiped out. And according to the World Health Organization, smallpox killed somewhere between 300 and 500 million people in the 20th century alone. And we bear in mind that it went extinct in 1977. That's actually 77 years of the 20th, of the 20th century. It's about 300 to 500 million people. Anybody can have a guess at who this guy is? William Jenner. William Jenner. William Jenner. William Jenner. Edward Jenner. Edward Jenner. Samuel Pepys. Samuel Pepys. No, no. It's, oh. not, it's not Edward Jenner either. This is a chap actually I've never heard of until the client started investing in. This is a guy called Cotton Mather. Oh, wonderful name. Oh, yeah. Cotton he Mather. Was the one who said infected blanks um, Yes and no. He introduced smallpox inoculation mm. to, the, to the States mm. um, something like 20 years before Edward Jenner was born. Yeah. <laughs> He's an interesting sort of guy, as well as writing about uh, an account of smallpox inoculated in New England. He wrote over 400 books in his life. Wasn't he involved in um, Salem? He was certainly uh, wrote a lot of books about observations of devils and uh, witch trials. So I would not be surprised to find that he was involved in Salem, but I, I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me. He's the right time period and the right sort of nutter. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's Edward Jenner. Uh, as you can see, he's not born until 1749, some considerable time after Cotton Mather. And he's a chap who, as we all know, invented vaccination. And whenever I read anything about all these, oh, you give your kids MMR and make their ears drop off, or it causes autism, or it causes something, or it causes something. I think back to poor old Jenna, who, in terms of public health and saving lives, would have done more than any other man ever born. And this is the sort of reaction he got when he tried to introduce vaccination to British society. This is, a, this is the vaccination party cartoon, in which the people on the left are lining up to be given this, this red slop. And the people on the right had it, and you can see that there's a guy with a cow growing out of his nose, somebody getting horns, cow getting... <laughs> You've got to convert this into these, these genetic chimeras. Uh, so poor old, uh, poor old gentleman wasn't very, wasn't very popular. But uh, he, he was not. Mather introduced, the, dis the difference between Mather and Jenner, incidentally, is Mather didn't invent anything. Mather took a pre-existing practice. In fact, Mather, it is said, was told by one of his slaves what his tribe did in Africa to protect themselves against smallpox. Uh, and we, we know that, that this was being done in India at least 3,000 years ago. Uh, but what they did was they took... It's not technically pus, but it's vesicular fluid. <laughs> it's yes, I'm a pedant. I'm not going to say pus. It doesn't have white cells in it. Uh, they, they were took uh, uh, fluid from the blisters of patients who had smallpox but didn't seem to be too badly affected. They had a mild strain. And they would deliberately infect their children with it in the hope that by catching the mild form of smallpox, you would then be immune from any more virulent strain that came later. It does work, but it does have a significant mortality rate. You are, after all, giving people smallpox, and even the mild forms are nothing to joke about. He said, joking about that. <coughs> there you go. Jenna developed, or well, Jenna made the observation that milkmaids rarely got smallpox. I, th I think, to be honest, milkmaids knew that milkmaids didn't get smallpox and probably told it rather than he observed it. <laughs> but he was a man, and the, therefore his opinion counts, and the milkmaids were women, and hence their opinion didn't. So that's how it's in the books. Uh, I'm just saying that's what's in the books, and that's why, I'm sure that's why it's in the books, rather than what actually happened. Uh, so he, he invented the process of, of vaccination. In this, again, you take fluid from the blisters of a patient with an active disease, but it's not smallpox, it's a related DNA virus, cowpox, which has enough immune similarity to smallpox that the antibody you raise against it protects you against smallpox. It works, works very, very well. Side effects are few, and deaths are almost unknown compared to, to inoculation, which, which is why vaccination has taken over. And again, if we wish to be pedantic, 
Smallpox is the only disease for which there is vaccination processes. Everything else, there's an immunization process. Vaccination comes from the Latin vacca, meaning cow, specifically related to cowpox. That said, everybody says vaccine, everybody says vaccinations, but if you want to get this smart answer, questions of that sort, do. it's the sort of thing you can, you can drop into the conversation, or it may take you half an hour to steer the conversation around. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could just happen to drop that in. Does Capbox still exist, or is it Capbox? Oh, Capbox still exists. Yes, okay. yes. Um, it's it's a lot less prevalent no, because it's the, the well, yeah. We don't have milk <laughs> anymore. We have milking machines, so there's a lot less cow-human contact, and everybody washes their hands and everybody wears gloves. So it's around, but it, it's it's now a sort of historical novel. Not historical it's only called bets. There's only Wally's bets and farmers. Yes. Yeah. I couldn't find any data on that. Um, when you when you start talking about very large populations, people die of anything. You know, you get you get a splinter on your finger, you get a splinter on your finger. Some people can be oh, you you gardening and you prick your rose, prick your thorn on a rose, <laughs> prick your thumb on a rose thorn. Every so often, some poor body gets ground positive septicemia. It's really nasty. You shut down your internal organs and you die. So. You know, everybody dies of something. <laughs> you know, things, can, things can be incredibly yeah. safe, you know, one in a thousand. Well, no, if I had a treatment that, that had a one in a thousand, you know, one in a thousand sounds quite safe, doesn't it? 999 out of a thousand. But, you know, I have 1,500 medical students in my school. If I had a fatality rate on my course of one in a thousand, <laughs> that's a student and a half in a year, you know. <laughs> <laughs> one, in, one in a million sounds really, really safe, but if you're introducing a public health program where you give something to everybody, well, that's 60 of us in the UK alone. So I am sure there have been deaths from cowpox, but I don't know of any. So smallpox is extinct, and it's the only disease that we have so far managed to make completely extinct. Uh, and, and the question is, why, why have we managed it for smallpox? There are, and I even use the word here, vaccines. There are, there are immunization programs available for a lot of diseases. Some of them don't work very well. Some of them work very, very well. But no other infectious disease has been completely wiped out. And this is because of a, of a combination of factors. Firstly, smallpox is a serious disease, so there was political will to act globally. We in Britain could introduce a program to vaccinate everybody in the UK. And that would be fine if nobody from the UK ever went abroad, nobody from abroad ever came home, and birds didn't fly here, cargo didn't come in, and so forth. So to actually wipe something out, you need a global program, and you need a global coordinated program. There's no point in clearing out Britain, and then going and clearing out India, and then going and clearing out Australia. And then by the time you get back to Britain, some cases have come in from Pakistan, and you've got to start again. So it was a globally coordinated program. The other really, really important thing is that nobody except us gets smallpox. So if you can wipe out smallpox in the human population, it's gone. If we could wipe out, well, we, we more or less have wiped out rabies in the human population. There is very little rabies in the human population. But there are animal reservoirs. So it doesn't matter how many times you clear it from the people, you get it back to the wild animals. What about polio? I'm coming back to polio. Oh, okay. I didn't say I'd done no preparation for this talk. I said I'd done not as much preparation. <laughs> <laughs> we, are, we are coming back to polio. Is it true that, that they keep in a sample of smallpox in a sort of safe environment? Again, this is something which I hope we're we'll coming on to now. So, over the last uh, although Jenna brought in his vaccination a long time ago, over the last 50 years, uh, last, sorry, the last 100 years, we've seen much improved vaccines which are more effective. <coughs> They're heat stable, so you can ship them out to Pakistan, Afghanistan, Africa, wherever, and you don't need to keep them refrigerated, which on a, on a global program is a big problem. Um, what the World Health Organization decided to do, it worked so well that in the UK we stopped vaccinating in 1974 which is why I was able to split the room into Group A and Group B. Uh, 
on the basis of apparent age. I hope I haven't insulted anyone. <laughs> a related technique, incidentally, if you ever want to wind up somebody who's into astrology, is you can tell them, and I, I need to do a little bit of read-up because it's a start point you need to know, you can tell someone where, which house they've got Pluto in on their date of birth. And they go away and they look and they check, and you were right. And the reason is that Pluto only changes houses every 38 years. <laughs> so if you can guess somebody's age to within 38 years, <laughs> and can remember the start house, and I can't remember what, what it is at the moment, uh, you can tell them when we're Pluto. Anyway, uh, so the last naturally occurring case in the wild was uh, in 1975 in, I think, Pakistan. And the disease was then officially declared extinct by the World Health Organization after there had been no cases for two years. That was the longest break there had ever been between cases. <coughs> and yay, there was much rejoicing. But three reservoirs of, of virus were kept for research purposes. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether it was one of these. Yeah, um, oh. Urban yes, urban myth. No, yeah. no, there, it was certainly kept. There was a, a section, there were, there were samples kept in the uh, Virology Research Lab in Birmingham. The CDC in Atlanta have them. Uh, place, uh, if you're ever, ever writing a BioWareFare novel, this has got to be your bad guys. Vector. <laughs> <laughs> That's their actual name. They are called Vector. <laughs> in in, in uh, Russian, State Research Center of Virology and Biotechnology. And back to in Kosovo, uh, in some of the words from the USSR anymore, I don't know where it is these days. How do you keep the virus alive without hosts? Uh, there's two ways, it depends on the virus. Some viruses, when dry, are stable. Um, viruses are peculiar. I mean, there's sort of arguments about whether they're alive or not. They have a crystalline structure. They're not like a cell, which is a bag of fluids and enzymes. A virus has a, has a protein coat, a DNA core, and a couple of enzymes, and that's it. But it uses the host cells uh, mechanisms to replicate. Which means if you take, you know, if you take a begonia off your windowsill and just sit and leave it, don't give it any food, don't give it any water, it will die. But viruses in their dormant state aren't actually doing anything. So they will degrade, you know, just random, like, you know, like, like bits fall off your furniture and we sort of give it. If you have a vial of dried smallpox, yeah, after a while it goes inactive. But although uh, most viruses can be cultured in the laboratory, even if they don't infect uh, any wild animal, you can sometimes grow viruses in, of all things, chicken eggs or cell cultures. So human cell cultures will, will grow smallpox by happening. So you can keep them alive that way, or sometimes you can keep them dry. So we know that those three centers uh, existed officially. The North Koreans didn't take part in the World Health Organization program. They organized their own separate program. Mm. And, well, do you think they've got smallpox virus? <laughs> and that's not including the, um, the classified uh, reserves, people like the US and the British and the Russians. Oh, it, it, well, there's not a point in having a secret classified reserve if, you, if you've got a public declared open one. Yeah, no, but if you know there's yes. a public declared one, there's, and that gets wiped out, you've still yeah. got, I'm oh, sure the oh, indeed, indeed. military have stashed. Yeah, that'll be an off-site battle. Now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> always back If, if you remember back yeah. to my... You said that you've got the DNA. Would it be worth considering sort of taking the DNA sequencing and saying, right, we've got the blueprint of what it is, uh -huh. so we can get rid of it so as it doesn't get nicked, stolen, leaked out. Jack Cohen is the man to answer that question rather than me. He, he will tell you that it's, there's more to an organism than its DNA. Mm. Um, it's, it's like... If I gave you the DNA of a dinosaur, how could you grow a dinosaur? You don't have a dinosaur egg to put the DNA in. You have a so you have a chicken's egg. So then you're, you're, you're using the DNA in the wrong environment, it won't express properly, it won't work as it would do in a dinosaur. So it might be close, it might be miles off, and, and how would you know? You could theoretically design a DNA sequence for an organism in which you have two completely different organisms with exactly the same DNA. 
Because basically the DNA says, um, am I growing in a mummy that has legs? Yes, therefore I will grow legs. The same DNA says, am I growing in a mummy that has legs? No, oh, therefore I will grow tentacles. So the things with legs have babies with legs, the things with tentacles have babies with tentacles. It's exactly the same DNA. It's how the program is running and the state the program is in. There is more to that than just um, the, the, the DNA. Anyway, we, we, we are digressing, as, as is so often the way. Uh, so what we're going to say, if you remember back to the back to the, the first or second or third slide or the slide, I said that smallpox went extinct in '77 and then again in '78. And the reason is is that there were two deaths in 1978 smallpox. Two people became infected from the stored sample. Remember, I said there were three places that were stored smallpox. Well. Yeah. Two people got infected, one of them died. I said there were two fatalities. I had a department was so distraught over what had happened and his what he committed suicide. Now, as a result of that, Birmingham officially no longer has any smallpox, and we don't keep any officially. Portland down, who knows? <laughs> but the other interesting thing is that uh, in <coughs> So 2003, I think it was actually 2004, somebody at uh, University Library in Santa Fe took a book down off a shelf, opened it up, and found inside the back cover an envelope full of smallpox scabs. Yeah. <laughs> 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 They've been there. Um, I kept my smallpox scab when I got vaccinated, but I was like 11 at the time. Yeah. And my yeah, mum and I she was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, these were probably part of Cotton Mother's inoculation program. This was smallpox scabs from a family who had, had smallpox being kept ready to inoculate the next set of kids in the village. And had just been stuck in an envelope. The person who found them emailed the, the university museum and said, would you be interested in these? They went, ah. they, exactly, they went, ah. <laughs> uh, As far as we're aware, uh, the virus in them was not viable. Which is probably a good thing. Yeah, when, it. when I was a student at, at Leeds, which was 75 to 81, our pathology museum had a wax cast of an arm showing smallpox scabs. And it had been made by getting a patient who had smallpox, making a cast of the arm, making a wax model, making a cast of the wax model, making a wax model from the mold, making a mold from the arm. They repeated that seven times. So that the final arm um, model had not only had not been in contact with anything that had been in contact with anything that had been in contact with anything that had been in contact with the patient back through seven generations. Mm -hmm. um, but one of my colleagues decided that even that was too much of a risk and we had it destroyed. I'm afraid it's gone. That's how paranoid we are about small mm -hmm. Probably just as well. I think that's my last smile. Oh no, there we go. Yeah, we go. 1947 film. The killer that stalks New York, one woman brings terror to eight million people. Mm. Not the Thatcher biography. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the plot line for those of you who want to, want to dig it out of the library if you can find it is that this woman has just come back from South America smuggling diamonds. So the police are looking for her because of diamonds and the medical team are looking for her because she's got smallpox. Mm. Sounds like um. carrot cat, sounds classic. Seems awfully well to be found about and doing. Yeah, smallpox is afraid of hearts. Now she's feverish, she doesn't understand the day. It used to be worries that smallpox um, you know, could survive in graves. Yes. Um, somebody could be dead hundreds of years and die of smallpox. Th this is one of the things that they always worry about the plague pits in London. Yeah. I think the general feeling is that anywhere down. Probably fairly but what about safe. Like that Egyptian mummy. But the Egyptian mummy, they are more of an issue. Yeah. As I say, the stuff is pretty stable, but not as stable as another disease we're going to come back to later. Yeah. Uh, so, on the whole, it's probably not too much of an issue. Mm -hmm. We no longer have smallpox vaccine in any quantity. If we did have another outbreak, we'd be back to the cows. <laughs> we'd be back to the cows. I mean, those of us who have the vaccine are probably still immune. <coughs> So there would be a rush to, to vaccinate the under-tools. Yeah. All, all, 
these rules about this, this vaccination will last you n years and then you need a booster are all actually somebody in the office going, I reckon it will last uh, yeah. five years. Because if you look at the, the advice for tetanus, yeah, they'd be stretching yeah. it and stretching yeah. it and stretching yeah. it. Yeah. Every yeah. time saying, I was due well, you know, nobody, to Nobody's getting tetanus, let's go from seven years to ten years. Let's go from ten years to twelve years. So. Well, I do know somebody who managed to come down to set tetanus when you have been in the post. Well, again, no, no vaccine is 100% effective. <laughs> Okay, so that was smallpox. Smallpox is gone. Smallpox is, uh, has, uh, has uh, been rendered extinct. And it's an interesting philosophical argument about was that a good thing or was that genocide? <laughs> yeah. You know, if, it, if smallpox was a species of beetle, yes. we would go, oh, terrible. This it would be the symbol of the wildlife fund. <laughs> <laughs> it could actually be useful if you think about it. You might care something else. Oh, no. Mm. I mean, you think of something like um, chorionic. If something can last a long time, then maybe that could be the way of preserving life in space. Genetically. Or until you do freeze dry. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Possibly. Anyway, I think, uh, <laughs> I think we'll probably move on from smallpox. Uh, chlorosis. I think you probably not heard of chlorosis, but I like this one. When I decided to do these slides, I thought what I'll do is I'll have a tombstone and a, and a birth, date of birth and date of death. And I went looking for pictures of chlorosis, not actually expecting to find any. But Wikipedia, not Wikipedia, Google Images threw up this. I have chlorosis. I think every lecture I ever give now, I'm not going to bother looking for pictures of people who've actually got a disease. I'm just going to take this and edit it. <laughs> <laughs> I have rabies. I have TV. Actually, she's so cheerful about it. She does seem remarkably cheerful about it. Uh, chlorosis. Yeah. It's not as not as old as smallpox. Uh, not well. At least the term chlorosis is not as old as smallpox, uh, and it became extinct in 1936. Yeah, I'm going to refer to my notes here because this this really is this is really well. Chlorosis, uh, described by Johannes Lang in 1554. It's also known as Morbus virginius, the virgin's disease, or Friberis amatoria, the lover's fever. <laughs> so that narrows it down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So you've got the same, by the way. In uh, 1615, this guy, Jean van der Rohe, gave it the name of chlorosis because it was said that the victims had a peculiar green tinge to the skin. Uh, slightly later, just before 1700, an English physician called uh, Sidenham, who, who names several diseases and signs and symptoms all over associated with them, chorea and other things. Uh, he classified chlorosis as a hysterical disease affecting not only adolescent girls, but also slender and weakly women that seem consumptive. Uh, he advocated iron as a treatment to the worn out or languid blood it gives a spur or fillet whereby the animal spirits which lay prostrate and sunken under, under their own weight are raised and excited. You don't, you don't get writing about like that in the VHS. Sadly, really. Indeed, indeed. Uh, so, you're okay. Try to slide behind. Um, Daniel Turner didn't like uh, chlorosis uh, from, from the green. From the green. Uh, he preferred to call it the pale or white sickness as the people were rather pale. And, and yes, again, this is a wonderful one. He described it as an ill habit of body arising either from obstructions, particularly of the menstrual purgation, or from a congestion of crude humours in the viscera, vitiating the ferments of the bowels, especially those of concoction, and placing therein a depraved appetite of things directly preternatural, such as chalk, cinders, earth, sand, etc. And he wrote that, including all the capitals, by the way. That's a direct transliteration. And he abbreviates, etc. properly. <coughs> uh, this bit about the chalk, cinders, earth, and coal. One of it, one of his patients was an eleven-year-old girl who had a habit of eating coal. And from from you know, single observations are gross over oversimplifications made. Um, incidentally, eating things like that is called pica, traditionally associated with pregnancy. Nobody really understands why. They sort of, oh well, you know, your body knows it's deficient in iron. Well, it's not deficient in coal, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, chlorosis was, was 
basically thrown around as a diagnosis for any young woman who, who was acting a bit odd. Uh, but it stuck with this for a long time. The green sickness, the, degree, the disease of maids occasioned by celibacy. Uh, Casanova mentions it. I do not know, but we have some physicians who say that chlorosis in girls is the result of that pleasure yeah. indulged <coughs> into excess. <laughs> a little later, this chap decided the treatment of hot chocolate with iron filings in it. <coughs> Back to iron again. Uh, and then, getting you know, up towards present time, Trousseau, again, a, a famous French physician, advocated, again, treatment with Ireland, but he still thought that, that chlorosis was basically you know, nervous upset. There was nothing really behind it. As time went by, uh, Andrew Clark said, well, there's a physiological reason for this. We see chlorosis in young women who are going through the adolescent growth spurt and starting their periods. It's to do with iron. And uh, in in, in um, 1895, it was shown that it was iron was in hemoglobin. We tend to, you know, we all know everything in that. Hemoglobin's got iron in it. But that's actually a relatively recent uh, piece of information. But it wasn't until 1936 that these two guys at Harvard decided that chlorosis was exactly the same as the thing we now call hypochromic anemia. Uh, although they said anemia. Because Americans can't spell it. So that's, uh, that's another condition I shall never diagnose, chlorosis. But when they've got hypochromic anemia. Yeah, because they don't go green, so it's a terrible name, we don't know what causes it. And it's not a diagnosis in its own right. There are lots of things cause iron deficiency anemia. Um, that's that's really but there is, but there, is, there is really nothing to, to say that you're feeling a bit chlorotic. <laughs> but it's a bit like fit of the vapors. <laughs> So chlorosis, chlorosis has gone, but actually chlorosis was never really with us. It was just a misunderstanding of what was going on. When I tell you what GLEAT is, you may backtrack on that. <laughs> GLEAT is a wonderful word for Scrabble. Commit it to memory. Uh, we believe it uh, joined the human race in around about 200,000 years BC. And I'm, I'm slightly, slightly, uh, slightly hedging my bets here. Gleet is technically not a disease. Gleet is technically a complication of a relatively common and well-known disease. Although in sheep, there is a disease called Gleet. Um, anyone can have a guess? Gleet <laughs> is a complication of gonorrhea. Uh, in the Victorian times, 1900s, 1920s, 1930s, the back page of gentlemen's magazines would be full of discreet bloodlets like this one. Gono, man's for Gono. I mean, there's a trade name to Gono. <laughs> for gonorrhea and gleet, an unequal remedy for all unnatural discharges. Allays inflammation and cures gonorrhea and gleet. Uh, small problem, of course, is that it didn't. <coughs> you can make all sorts of claims in those days. Uh, that's, a, that's an American advert. I think this one is as well. Yeah, New York. Get a gleet clock, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> gleet clock, certainty, etc. Abbreviated properly. Extra points for any of my students who like that. So, well, I've said it's a, it's a uh, complication of gonorrhea without saying what it is. But, just a quick reminder, gonorrhea is an infectious disease caused by a bacterium. So we've had a virus, a deficiency, and now we've got a bacterium. It is highly infectious. In certain circumstances, you have a 60% chance of catching it per circumstance. One circumstance, 60-20%. And it used to be highly sensitive to penicillin. Now it mostly isn't. It's resistant. It's, it's getting resistant to the second line drug, uh, ciprofloxacin. The third line drug, which can only be given by injection, is called spectanomycin, and it's what we call an orphan drug. There's not a lot of call for it, 
It's out of patent, so there's not a lot of money to be made from it. And the cost of keeping a production line going isn't worth it. So the manufacturers occasionally think, about time to make some spectatomycin again, I suppose. And they make a batch, and it sits in warehouses, and then sort of six months later, all over the literally all over the world, clinics are going, we need some spectatomycin. Well, there's none in Britain. We can, well, there's some in Australia. We'll get some from Australia. And it runs out. Uh, and it, this is threatening to be a really major problem. Because if we lose our remaining antibiotics against gonorrhea, it will be back uh, where, as if it had never gone. Like they've never been gone. Now, I think my next picture is the slightly gooey one. There was a very nervous disposition. I think it's the next one. Look away now. Look away now. Those of you, those of you who don't know, want to know how it finishes, look away now. Uh, oh no, it's alright, this is a safe one. This uh, this is a smear of pus, and this is pus. <laughs> because it's got pus cells in it. These things here are white blood cells, polymorphs. That's a single cell with a single nucleus, but it's by load. And they get three, four, five loads as they get older. So when you look at a, at a smear yeah, they're of pus, they're they, 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 they could strip their new piece and split it up into loads. I have no idea why they do this, but it's something they do over age. These things only, la only live three, four, five days. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at a, at a blood smear, you can see whether you're looking at a very recent infection because you've got lots of polymorphs with only one lobe or two lobes, or older infection. It's been going well, you see more. Um, Anybody who's, who's got a biological background has probably heard of macrophages, cells that eat to debris, and things gets broken down. Uh, macrophages were described by a German pathologist called Metchnikoff, and he called them macrophages for the big eaters to distinguish them from B cells, microphages, little eaters. But we now call them polymorphonuclear leukocytes. And these blocks here, inside the cytoplasm of this polymorph, these are gonorrhea bacilli, they're not bacilli, bacteria. They're, little, they're, they're sort of kidney bean shaped and they classically sit in pairs face to face. So it is one of the few conditions that you can just look at the bug and, and get a diagnosis. Bacteria sort of only covered about three shapes and two colours. But with, with these guys, you can get your diagnosis in clinic in 10 minutes because the gram stain is really, really quick and easy. Okay, I suspect the next picture is the one I was concerned about. Yeah. This is a condition called Ophthalmia neonatorum. It's an ocular infection by gonorrhea transmitted at birth. And it was until 1950s the commonest cause of blindness in the UK. So that's what we're looking at if we lose our ability to have a drug to cure gonorrhea. That's what we're looking at. they look at phages? They look at all sorts of things. But I'm, I'm not up to date on that research, but I know that my missus, my, my wife works in a GU medicine clinic, by the way, and she is forever moaning about the fact that they're having trouble getting on to a time line and this is nothing else suitable. Uh, so what's GLEAT? Well, GLEAT is specifically scarring and stricture formation in the urethra. If you get, you know, if you if you get inflammation anyway, if you get you get an abscess in the back of your hand, if you cut your finger, you burn yourself, whatever, you get a scar. Uh, it's, a, it's a healing process. Specialized tissues are replaced with non-functional structural tissue to stop you bits falling off, as it were. And on the outside, that's not a big deal. If, if I burn the back of my hand, it's unpleasant. I get a scar, it's unsightly, it doesn't do me any harm. If I was to get a scar that went all the way around, when that shrinks, it can actually cut off the blood supply to, to my hand. And part of the treatment of severe burns involves deliberately opening the, the scar tissue, laying it open surgically, so that the blood gets through. So that's on the outside. This is on the inside, but it's exactly the same principle. You get inflammation around the urethra. As it scars up, it constricts. Gleep is particularly a problem for men because we have long urethras, ladies have short urethras, and it's not so much for this year. 
Uh, it used to be a very common cause of urinary retention in Victoria and this morning, gentlemen. Urinary retention is still a common problem. I, I spent six months as a junior surgeon out in Scarborough on a urology unit where every time I was on take, I would admit three or four men who were suddenly unable to pass urine and I had to go and pop a catheter in. To them, which is less unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, not nice, but actually, you know how unpleasant it is if you need the glue and you can't get because you're stuck in a car or somewhere? Well, mm -hmm. imagine it's taken out of your control and you can't. Uh, and it just gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. So it's not very pleasant of a capital to put in. But those, those guys would have signed their houses over to me, I tell you. <laughs> yeah. um, so it, that's, it's usually due to enlargement of the prostate in man, as I say, we don't see bleed much these days. And it can be seen in association with acute herpes in men, or more commonly in women. It can be seen in association with nerve damage, where the, the muscular control of the sphincter is gone. Uh, and, and the same with, with cancer infiltration, you, you, you get lots of uh, mobility of the tissue. There are also things you can do. The acute treatment we used to use was, as I say, to put a catheter in. These days, you've got a big prostate, they'll resect the prostate. And if you've got a stricture, <coughs> you can uh, dilate it up and stent it. And uh, put the next slide in just to make all the men <laughs> uh, cross their legs. These things at the bottom are called bungees. <coughs> They're not life size, you would have to know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, the, the classic one for this tip is called an acorn tip catheter, and it's about the size and shape of an acorn. So, yeah. Um, as I said, gleam is not something we see anymore in, in the UK. This is, these are the instructions on how to deal with a gleam stricture from a current surgical textbook, because although we don't see it, it is still around in the rest of the world. Something about which we warn all our students before they go on the lecture. <laughs> so, okay, gentlemen, you can uncross your legs now. <laughs> and we all, we all know about Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he invented the glass harmonica, the lightning rod. Bifocals. Uh, Bifocal lenses. <coughs> um, something, to do with, something to do with the, with the, with the mint. I can't remember what it was now. Franklin stove. Sorry, the Franklin stove. Yes, the Franklin stove. I think he uh, ran the mint for a while. Yes, he did. Um, There's still a Franklin mint in America. Mm. Well, some <laughs> some American textbooks will tell you he invented the catheter. Strictly, he didn't. There were catheters in use in Europe at the time, but he did have a wonderful. Ooh. Incident. Men had to carry these catheters around to use on themselves. Uh, Franklin had the wonderful idea of inventing a flexible catheter. And the great thing about the flexible catheter, which made it considered a great breakthrough, was you could roll it up and tuck it in your hand. <laughs> 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 now, until we got penicillin in the 40s, there were no effective treatments for gonorrhea. We saw all those old adverts, none of them were worked out. And all the public health departments could do was try and run advertising public information campaigns. They were as subtle as a brick to the back of the head, as you can see. Duke Joint Sniper. This, this is um, uh, American Army propaganda. The other one, she may look clean, but notice incidentally that it's only women who spread gonorrhea. <laughs> <laughs> Never quite clear where they got it from. But, uh, <coughs> so yes, this, this, uh, this is the, the ab absolutely standard in all the public health posters of the time. They're always warning the men about the women. Finally, we did get gonorrhea. Sorry? Men made the adverts. Oh, yes. Men ran the public health departments uh, and men ran the advertising agencies. Yes. But when, when, when penicillin finally became available, it was such a big deal that the fact that gonorrhea could be treated was advertised in the streets. Penicillin cures gonorrhea in four hours. <laughs> <laughs> 
which means you have to move back out and catch it again tonight. <laughs> 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 so, no. Gleet is gone, mm -hmm. not forgotten, not missed. Who knows? Hysteria. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's, it's, well, let's, just, let's just go ahead. Hysteria. <laughs> if you read some of the older textbooks, here we go. <coughs> a condition of women caused by disturbances of the universe. I've got some notes at this point. The women get an awful lot, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. They yeah. don't get man float. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'll never go extinct. <laughs> Contagious, that is. <laughs> the, 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 ori the, origin, the origin of the term hysteria is from the Greek hysteros, meaning the uterus. Uh, and it, it is said by people who came after Hippocrates that Hippocrates said hysteria was caused by the movement of the uterus around the body. Uh, and I heard somebody asking, wow. Alan, the answer is. Uh, yeah, we could do that. The movement of the woman's uterus to various locations within the body as it became light and dry due to the lack of fluids. <laughs> uh, You're not getting enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny enough what it says. Funny you should say that. <laughs> uh, one passage recommends pregnancy to cure the symptoms because intercourse will moisten the womb and facilitate blood circulation within the body. <laughs> uh, as I say, the people who were writing in the, the 1700s and 1800s say that Hippocrates said this. Um, he actually didn't. He did describe other conditions which were due to the uterus wandering around the body. So the one thing to his theory was that when he thought it But it is, it is slightly cheating to say that he said that hysteria was caused by it. A wandering uterus. A hysterical woman. A wandering uterus. <laughs> 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 now, the reason I've said that, that hysteria is extinct is that the, the, the term has now fallen out of use. It really doesn't mean anything. It is still technically in the... the, the there, is the, there is the boys book of book of diseases. <laughs> the, the things what you're allowed to diagnose. Um, so you're saying you can't get hysterical? <laughs> you get hysterical, but it's not a disease. That's yeah. Um, what was I saying? There is, there is a, the boys' book of disease, which is a whacking great tone. And there is a separate one for psychiatrists, with all the psychiatric disorders in it. Um, and at the moment, hysteria is still in there. But at the moment, all psychiatrists say, well, it shouldn't be. And probably the next edition or the edition after, it will have gone. So hysteria, having come in with the properties of 2000 BC, has, well, it's on its last legs, and it's probably on its way out. But that would be too easy, and I wouldn't have anything more to talk about. So instead, the other way, the, the other time that the word hysteria is used is in the phrase mass <coughs> hysteria. Public waves of panic. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it certainly does. There's one that only boys can. We'll come to that in a minute. Which bit of you is It's thought that the psychology of these mass hysteria events is rather like UFOs. Like nobody's seeing UFOs these days, but they're seeing ghosts and poltergeists. Mm -hmm. oh. um, I don't do rock out of the job. No, 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 no. But um, crop circles came and went. And yeah. But I thought it would be fun to look at some uh, some well-known mass hysterias. The Dancing Plague of Strasbourg, 16th century, started off one summer when a woman, for reasons that nobody really understands or knows, took to dancing in the street. And she danced without stopping for accounts vary, but the best part of a week. Other people joined in. Someone travelled back in time and taught a Gundam style. <laughs> <laughs> Within a month, there were about 400 dancers. There is lots of documentation from the time, lots of contemporary reports in supposedly reasonable sources. 
church records, local magistrates, all sorts of things. As with all events, when somebody writes them what they say, there are minor variations, but they all agree that a large number of people, apparently against their will, were dancing without stopping the streets. And this is where just the Yeah. Somebody Yes, I should. Yes. But I think with the number of people here and the lack of deaths, that she that the first patient may well have had something or or she may well have been, as we've got to say, nuts. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she was only nuts for a week. Yeah. Well, yeah, four to six days of class. I tried to find out if any of the, a lot of the sort of the side references to, to this event talk about people dancing to death. I couldn't get any good documentation as to whether anybody actually died. Do you think this is where any of the, MC, the, the story of the red shoes comes from? Mm -hmm. Could be, I don't know. So the young woman who puts on a pair of red shoes, and of course then she wants to stop dancing, but the shoes haven't, and eventually yeah. she dances to death. But whether there's that any basis of where that story might have originated. Could be. Mm -hmm. Certainly could be. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you're asking about, uh, about mass hysteria for boys. This one, this one is for the gentlemen only. I'm sorry, lady, you do not allowed to catch this one. This is called Coro. Coro. <laughs> Just gonna go and check. Come on, 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 the DVD on the right, incidentally, a million blackouts and nothing to do with Coro the hysteria, <laughs> but it was the only publicly presentable picture I could find <laughs> <laughs> with the word Coro on it. <laughs> but yes, uh, it's primarily Singapore area, Singapore, Malaysia, and some places in Africa. The word Coro comes from the Malay word meaning the head of a turtle. And Cory Corioki. Is there any actual disease that can cause the retraction of the penis into the body? No, it's called it. <laughs> no, it's, 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 yeah. it's nailed on. It doesn't retract. <laughs> <laughs> the, the testicles which can retract. Mm -hmm. The dartos and, and uh, yeah. crevasse muscles, but but the penis doesn't. Mm -hmm. It's fastened on. How far can I go in mixed company? Mm -hmm. The penis yeah. is actually about this long. Mm -hmm. um, but the bit that you see is the outer bit. That is, there are two extra bits that run along the underside of the pelvis and, and basically are the, the structure of the foundation. And that is not going anywhere. That is, that is <laughs> um, yeah. What about the rare condition with uh, a gender related where you have born a boy mm -hmm. and then it can sort of seven and whatever and it can totally, the organs totally revert? I've not come across that. I There's one where you, you book up a boy and then, and then around seven and things, it can totally change back and so you become a girl. It does totally change inside out. Isn't that born in Africa? No, it's not in Africa. I've not come that. across that. There, there are lots of <coughs> very, very strange congenital deformities of the European <coughs> system because its, it's embryology is so incredibly complex that all sorts of things can go wrong. Um, and children can be born with ambiguous genitalia, well, which you can't I can't decide. Because in 67, that's when all the porn films started. Um, for example, there is a, there is a condition, it's, it's an endocrine of the adrenal glands. It's, it's to do with salt metabolism. Because of the way it interferes with hormone metabolism, in the uterus, yeah. children are exposed uh, too much testosterone and the other androgens, the other male hormones. In male, male boys, in male babies, they're born with, with an unusually large penis, which creates an incredibly proud father. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
And then sadly, these kids get incredibly sick at about the age of 10 days and, and frequently die. Whereas in girls, they're born with a very large clitoris and everybody goes, that's not right. And think, could this be um, salt music, salt music, salt music the adrenal general hyperplasia? Uh, start giving them, um, I say hormonal supplements, but it's actually not sex hormones, it's uh, salt, mineral and corticoid hormones. Uh, and keep them alive. So, so the, the mortality rate in boys is a lot higher than girls because girls get diagnosed. But as I say, the, the pediatric surgery in that area, you know, I want to do a Zoidberg. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even start to understand that. that uh, there, there, may not, there may not be a film called Coro yeah. that deals with the condition, but there is a film that came out in 2011 called Hysteria. Uh -huh. <laughs> And the, a Victorian London doctor, a young doctor struggles to establish himself. He's hired by a doctor to investigate treatments for women diagnosed with female hysteria. Yeah, and, and <laughs> when the cameras are off, I'll tell you what the treatment was as well. Yeah, yeah, it goes on to say here, but we're all oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's more serious injuries are caused by it because still reports coming out of those locations, and people have blamed for witchcraft. Mm. Oh yes, and yes. Uh, people, innocent people, get we'll, stoned, get, get strung up, up. Yes, yeah. because they say he cursed me, he made my penis yeah. disappear. That that tends to be the African yeah. side of things, but yes, you, you're quite uh, right. It happens. Happens in Malaya, Malaysia as well. Yeah, I want to say that the word "koro" is Malayan. <laughs> <laughs> for the, for the, 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 the blaming. Oh yes, yes. Mm. yes. Uh, okay, so yeah, and because there is no underlying disease. It is a pure hysterical mass mass hysteria phenomenon, and the way that it's dealt with is. To Stop the papers reporting, and the more the papers report it, the more cases. And now there's going to be an outbreak in Plymouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, did the check go okay? I quite like this Wait, one as well. This is a very specific one. There's only been one outbreak of this one. Horror happens all the time, but this is an interesting one. Uh, from what, 10 years ago? The Delhi monkey. People were reporting this strange creature, depending on who you talk to, it was 4 foot 6 or 5 foot 6. It only wore it had only a coat of hair, or maybe it wore a crash helmet. It did or it did not have glowing eyes and metal claws. Some reports that had a circuit board in its chest, you could get rid of it by throwing water on the circuit board and shorting it out. Or using gold. <laughs> <laughs> but but this is the thing I find that, that's incredible. I mean some people reported being scrapped, but some people apparently died trying to escape from this thing that didn't exist. Oh. Trying to climb out of a building rather than go down the stairwell. Yeah, how do you know they didn't get pushed down the sto stairwell by their wife and said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, he said there was a strange monkey-like yeah. creature just yeah. before she threw himself off the top of the building. Yeah. What is the chance of it being a real monkey? Yeah. Almost certainly somebody yeah. saw a real monkey, but then it's the story that spreads, <laughs> not the monkey. Yeah. Did you see what it means? Yeah. The wives got together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the way this is going, but the wives got together. Blame like yourself for yesterday's chat. Like, yeah. Some guy called Ranjan Harkin gave him a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so hang on, what have we done? We've done, we've done, we've done the dancing play, we've done the choro, we've done the monkey. We've done the sassy Hysteria. 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 Yeah. I'm not sure this is the last one. Yeah, this is, this is another fascinating one from about 20 years ago. I remember reading about this one at the time. Yeah. Uh, a woman with quite advanced cervical cancer was taken ill and was taken to hospital. And a lot of the staff who worked with her felt ill, felt lightheaded, even fainted. They said that she had a peculiar smell. Well, anybody who's worked in the receiving room knows a lot of patients <laughs> you don't normally make a comment about it, you just get on with it. Um, and her blood apparently contained flecks of a strange substance like paper, although strangely enough, the bit that went to the lab didn't. This was obviously when it was fresh. And it's been this is not the patient on the right. Again, I just wanted a picture of people in a, in a hospital. Everybody involved had normal blood tests. No infection was ever identified, no substance <coughs> that could explain the symptoms was was known or had any reason to be associated with them. It's not that she was coming from a factory where they worked with a lot of cyclohexane, 
Good company from home. Does this mean uh, members of the medical profession are not immune to being stupid? Certainly does. Yes. Oh my God, yes. And they're running it now? There are lots of stupid people in the medical profession. That is not being stupid because it's a requirement. Yeah. That, that is not, not being able to write is a requirement. <laughs> <laughs> drinking Bloody Marys in the bar, only they were tapping their own veins to add their own blood oh. and got thrown at the hotel. Have you seen our local medical staff in the building? <laughs> <laughs> We've got a medical doctor and a dentist here at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and several former ah. okay. so, so this is confirmed. within your medical experience, because obviously I'm an ex nurse yeah. auxiliary and I've done casualty. You always hear, I've never seen it, but you hear the urban myth, whether it is, of doctors who've gone out on the rouse or whatever, they've come back, sat themselves on a the chair, put a Venflom in, and put in a set of, um, you know, put in sodium or whatever to flush yeah. the alcohol out, and then gone to sleep like that. Have you ever seen it? I've never seen it. Again, I have heard of it. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard of it. I've never, I've never seen it. <laughs> yeah. And to be honest, if I'd been out on the rouse, I wouldn't, I don't think I could. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be willing to go with me mates, are <laughs> <laughs> But seriously, I don't think I could. Uh, I've also heard it, not so much going out on the RAS, but basically after an incredibly long shift. Mm. I do, I don't know whether it's hysteria, but something that sort of cure, uh, I've been curious of. Disease, particularly of the 16th century, known as the English sweating sickness. Have you ever heard of it? Supposedly it only ever kills the English. <laughs> well, that's the Spanish and the It must French. have been German input. It, it was I've good. not heard of it. it we, we, we were endemic for malaria at that time. So but yeah. everybody yeah. gave, the, gave the, the illness the name of somebody else. Oh, yes, I mean, yes. No, 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 this is specifically it was the affected the English. It's the French disease. The French called it the English disease. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, but that's, that's been applied to gonorrhea. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, until Hunter, John Hunter, very famous surgeon in the days when the, the distinction between surgeon and medicine was a bit more blurred. And in those days, there was a lot of argument between the dualists and the monoists as to, as to whether syphilis and gonorrhea were two diseases or just two manifestations of the same disease. <coughs> now, we now know that they are two completely different organisms. I showed you the gonorrhea bacteria. They're like little kidney beans sitting like that. Syphilis is caused by a thing like, caused by a spiral organism. So they are, they are completely different. But Hunter, uh, wanted to know what it was, so he got himself some, now which way round was it? He went and he got himself some pus from a patient with syphilis and infected himself. Oh. He then developed gonorrhea and published his paper saying gonorrhea and syphilis are the one disease because I got this I passed through a patient with syphilis and I infected myself and I got gonorrhea. Of course, what he didn't know was his patient had syphilis and gonorrhea. <laughs> so, a twofer. So he got a twofer and he got a pretty big value twofer because he died some years later of the complications of syphilis. So this is one of the reasons why it's very rare these days to find a doctor who infects himself. <laughs> Although, exception. with the possible exception of the guy who described Helicobacter pylori, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the thing that uh, is associated with gastric ulcers and gastric cancer, mm -hmm. and uh, he drank a cocktail of it. Apparently, he said, you know, so he drank a cocktail of it, and then he thought, that was a what have I done? But, you know, one day well, one eyes later, <laughs> there, there you go. There was a, there was a recent <laughs> television program on uh, hysteria where there was a, an American school, a girl who developed a stutter or something, and before yeah. long the stutter had yes. gone from the school, wasn't yeah. it? Because that was on the television. Yes, the, 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 once you start looking for cases like this, they are very common. I mean, I, I had no trouble picking up five here. Mm -hmm. I've got one last one. Mm -hmm. um, 
the June bug from the 1960s in an American textile factory. The work is in one area. She starts to complain of, of numbers and vomiting. And believed that there was some sort of insect going around biting them, causing the symptoms. But despite a, a thorough examination from the uh, CDC in Atlanta, the one that they blew up at the end of the first season of Walking Dead, <laughs> I'm telling anyone anyway, about the books. <coughs> Somebody here will know about the books. Um, this this was felt to be to be true mass hysteria, and it is closed environments like this. All the work is in one area of a factory. The children in a school, particularly a residential school, a boarding school, um, troops in the same barracks. It's these closed environments that particularly seem to foment. A lot of these hysterical events. Obviously, the Delhi monkey isn't like that. Obviously, the, the Strasbourg dancing plague isn't like that. But the common ones are, are very much like that. I'm sure if someone starts commenting, they will not be the point. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing, it was June, the weather was great. Why would you want to be in a sweatshop? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm feeling ill too. I'd better get out and do the fresh air. I don't feel well. I need to do all that full of my dehydration. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, but yes. you'll see it in some other things. Mm -hmm. well, that's just got the idea that everybody, there should be a water fountain and everybody should have a good water. Hot summer. So that, that's hysteria. Mm -hmm. I would say hysteria's gone. This is another one that's. Otherwise known as polio. Mm. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Again, on the on the tube stone, an EM of uh, polio virus this time. There is no cure. There is no cure. In fact, there isn't even a treatment. So yeah. Now polio has been with us for a long time. Um, it's, I put it down as being on the critical list. It's not actually dead yet. And I'm sorry to say that it's rallying. So. Polio <laughs> is a viral disease spread by the fecal oral route, which means exactly what it sounds like. Yeah. Which means that it happens in areas where the sanitation is poor and the water supply is frequently contaminated by sewage, and it tends to affect children whose hygiene is not as fantastic as it might be. In nearly all cases, about 99 out of 100, it is a minor illness that gives you diarrhea and vomiting. The diarrhea, of course, contributes to the fecal oral spread. And those 99% of cases recover without any problems at all, but it's the 1%. In about 1% 1 of cases, the virus spreads to the central nervous system, where the inflammation causes clots to form in the small arteries affecting bits of the spine. And that's when you get the neurological symptoms. There doesn't seem to be any evolutionary survival advantage to the virus to do this. It's felt that this is just coincidence, and from our point of view, not a very nice coincidence. But, but. We know polio has been with us for about uh, 5,000 years because this Egyptian plant shows what we regard as uh, a man with a withered leg. If you look at the little girl over there, her right leg, you can see that they, it's smaller than the leg on the other side, the paralyzed muscles don't grow. Um, and you'll see that the knee is bent backwards because, again, the joints are not being stabilized by the strength of the muscles, and they get they get damaged and deformed. And this chap, the other one, is uh, a thin, short, deformed leg. As well as the muscles not growing, the leg doesn't grow. The leg is often shorter. We have no cures. We have no treatments. We do have vaccines. The only treatments we have are calipers. So the chap on the left has got two calipers left. This, I, I'm amazed to find this picture. A fashion staple a, 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 yeah, a high heel fashion caliper. Why not? Why not? And notice again, because the leg is shortened, the whole thing has to be lifted up off the ground. If you look at the chap over in the other picture, you can see his left shoe is built up into a very thick, very thick uh, sole because of the, of the lack of growth of the leg. When I was a child, absolutely yeah. every kid was shot yeah. Yeah. one of these. When did, when did you last see one? 1970s. Yeah. 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 
one of the sad little boy holding his box, usually being kept company by a golden Labrador, looking for sad because he had a slot in his head. We used to collect tin foil for blue beetles, and pull out Labradors and put them on. The caliper, you got, to some extent, you got a lucky pair of My old boss, when I was a dermatology house officer, had a caliper, because he'd had polio when he was a child. If you were unlucky, the muscles that were affected were not the ones that controlled your legs or your arms, but the ones that controlled breathing. And if that happens, until the 1930s, you died. There was no treatment, there was no cure, there was nothing to do with it. But then, what was his name? Dr. Drinksler invented this, the Drinksler respirator. And I'm pretty sure this is an original, because it's, well, it's square. The original ones were. It's, it's basically made out of six sheets of plywood and the bits of two vacuum cleaners. And it works by... Unlike modern, you see somebody uh, being ventilated these days, there's a pipe going down either through the mouth or the nose or in through a tracheostomy, and it's positive pressure of ventilation, blows air into the lungs, expands the chest. This works the other way around, it surrounds you by an area where they control the pressure, drops the pressure in the box, your lungs expand and suck air in. So it's actually physiologically much more normal. It's nearer to normal ventilation than ever. But if you were very, very lucky, you might only need to sleep in one of these. You might be able to cope while you were awake. But you would be breathing with accessory muscles. It was very tiring, and most people had to live in these. As I said, there was no cure. If you went into one of these, you stayed in one of these. You came out and died. Imagine trying to sleep with the noise of a breathing machine all the time. Imagine having no control of your breathing. That's just one poor little child. Imagine working here. <laughs> that is the respirator ward from one of the hospitals in the western United States in the 1950s. I can count about 50. It's an, it's an American nurse's uniform. It, it is. It, it's it's somewhere in America, I don't know where. And uh, in, in 1950, Nine, I think the figure is there were 1,200 people living in respirators in the United States. And there still are about 30. Mostly living at home, incidentally. There are other things you can do. There's this, uh, what's it called? PEP, positive, no, you can plonk masks onto people and, and pump air in. Uh, a lot of people with sleep apnea or whatever mm -hmm. sleep in masks that increase the pressure in their airway. The best you can do is one of these. So there's still about 40 people living in The record for the length of time in one of these is held by an Australian woman who was in her iron lungs they ended up being called 63 years. Yeah. Died, I think, in, in the 1940s, you know, in the early 2000s. Why is it coming back? It's not coming back. I, I, I will move on. The history of the vaccines of polio <coughs> is quite interesting. The first um, vaccine trial from a, from a Polish immunologist was, was a live virus. He did some trials in Poland and the Belgian Congo in the 1950s. It worked, it wasn't brilliant. And the other problem with it is, is it's a live virus. It's attenuated, it's grown in culture, and it's supposedly weakened. So you give it to people, they get the immune response, but they don't get the disease. Do you remember I said earlier, it's all very well having something that's a one in a thousand, or, or a one in a million. Um, so we, 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 we don't like rare complications in public health programs. So it, later on, uh, Salk produced his killed virus. It's dead, it can't harm anyone, but it has to be given by injection, which people don't like. Sigmund in 57 brought in his live virus. That's what I had when I was a kid. Sugar, sugar lump virus. Yeah. 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 The reason they can put it on a, on a sugar lump, these days, well, 
We don't use it in the UK. Uh, they don't do it on a sugar lump anymore because sugar is bad for you. And you just drop it on your tongue. It's boring. Uh, but the reason you can get away with just dropping it on your tongue is that it's live. It infects you. It does all the work. Whereas the injectable ones, you have to inject. But it does have the problem. Because I actually remember having them. Yes, there are, there are boosters. Uh, when, when, uh, when my daughter had, when my daughter had her, she was just at the age of the third one. She was just starting to string sentences together. Only just. I took her into, into, into the doctor and I said, on my knee. The practice nurse came up. And out. I thought, okay, here are the tears. I'm ready. I'm still for it. Here are the tears. My daughter looked at me and she said, she pinned me <laughs> <laughs> with a pin. <laughs> and a look that said, what sort of father are you? <laughs> Someone pinned me with a pin. <laughs> well, you sat in the Exactly. Anyway. Wrap me around a little finger. Anyway, um, I said, the top of the line one is it does cause polio. One in just under a million cases. Back of an envelope, back of an envelope calculation. There are about 70 million of us in the UK. We live, let's say, 70 years. That's a million births a year. A one in a million complication would give polio to somebody every year. So we no longer use the line vaccine. Now, can we eradicate polio? It is a serious disease. It doesn't have an animal <coughs> host. So like smallpox, if we can get it out of the human population, we can get rid of it. So the World Health Organization, again, launched its Global Polio Eradication Initiative, because they were on a roll at this point. They've done smallpox. And since they introduced it, there has been a 99% reduction in cases of polio worldwide. And there are now only three countries where it is still endemic. Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Nigeria. Mm. Everywhere else, it doesn't exist in the world anymore. So you think, we're getting there. We're getting close. Unfortunately, June 15 this year, the Pakistani Taliban imposed a ban on polio vaccination because it is a part of a design by the United States to reduce Muslim populations. <laughs> and in fact, in South Waziristan, they've gone further, they've banned all vaccinations, not just polio. Now, admittedly, the Americans didn't help because they did run a clandestine operation to find bin Laden by using a hepatitis vaccination program as a cover for collecting DNA samples, and hence mapping family members. But, yeah. but sadly, that does mean at the moment we may or may not, because if we if we miss this opportunity and it spreads again, we're back where we started. We've got to do another global <coughs> production. I heard there was also some Nigerian uh, religious thing that some Christian group was saying not to have your children vaccinated with polio because it was I, all a plot. For yeah, the again, there's another extreme Muslim. There, there, are, there, 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 are, there are extreme groups like that everywhere. There are extreme groups like that in the UK and yeah. America and yeah. everywhere. But the Taliban are big enough and have enough power to actually, to actually matter. Make it, yeah. it, it, vaccination programs are weird because mm -hmm. if you can vaccinate, it, and it obviously depends on the disease, if you can get 90% of the population immune, then you've got what they call herd immunity. It actually works for everyone. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter if there's a small pocket of, of people who either, for religious or political reasons, don't want to have it, or just didn't get around to it, or were too ill to have it, or whatever. They are protected by the others. They're, they're, they're buffeted from the other cases. Yeah. We've got time for, for another one? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. 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 Bacillus yeah. anthracis. Oh, yeah. yeah. There go. Still with us. Still with us? Oh boy, is it still with us. In, uh, in, in, uh, yeah. in Britain, anthrax is a common disease in the world, but it was the time we're talking about, 100 years ago, i.e. the 1850s, where it was called either wool sources disease or leather workers disease. There was a lot of it in Leeds because we had a textile industry. It's a gram-positive bacillus, it's long and thin. Remember I said that the, um, 
Scoria bacteria were like little tiny round kidney beans. These guys are long and thin. There are, there are only a few basic shapes of, of bacteria, which is why it's so useful that, that, that gonococcus has this peculiar kissing habit with the two of them sitting together, because you can be pretty confident that he doesn't have the microscope. Uh, it affects you and it affects other animals, so we're never going to get rid of it by vaccinations alone. It has a tendency to form spores. Now, these are not like fungal spores, which restricts. Bacterial spores are a method of surviving the bad times. They pack up and they go into suspended animation and they can survive certainly hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, who knows. We do have effective treatments. It's pretty sensitive to good old penicillin. And there are effective vaccines. And US Army vaccinates all its personnel on active service. Don't know if we do or we don't. I hope we do. It's yes. a voluntary program that you encourage to. Right. Uh, before we got the antibiotics, which on the line of treatment, it was frequently fatal. Um, it is said that in World War II it killed hundreds of thousands, mainly in the concentration camps, <coughs> where we've got debilitated populations and it's, and it's easier for it to spread. There are three common sorts. Sorry about that, possibly I should have warned you about this one coming. Uh, cutaneous anthrax, this is, this is the wool sorters disease. You're rummaging through fleeces, you get a minor abrasion on your finger, the anthrax spores infect the wound. The other place that you, people would get it was on the shoulder. Any other one? Carrying. Carrying, yeah. You, you, you point your uh, uncured uh, hides over your shoulder. Again, minor abrasions go through. And it produces these classical black pustules, and hence, hence the name anthracis from the Greek for cold. Distinctive shape as well. I don't. Th I think that's just one of those things. I don't, I don't oh, think that's that's characteristic. Um, said to be painless, and most people recover, even in in pre-antibiotic days. This one is gastrointestinal anthrax. Um, I was going to bring these specimens with me, but eventually I chickened out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, because, well, because it occurred to me that if I dropped one and it spilled, I don't, I don't have access to the chemicals. It, to be honest, what it needs is lots of water and a bathroom beer. But I somehow thought going to the hotel manager and saying, I've dropped one of these specimens, what was it? Oh, it's okay. It's only anthrax. <laughs> These specimens are, are gastrointestinal anthrax. I have some cutaneous anthrax in the museum, but it's been lent out for history to part at the moment. Um, and as you can see, you've got these big black lesions. It's the same bacteria, so these big black hemorrhagic lesions in the gut, spread by contaminated meat rather than contact. And it is, even if treated, Faithfully, about half of cases, non treated, I would say. I have no current figures, but I would go to it's going to be faithful. Anything, anything that puts a, a hole through from one side of your bowel to the other gives you peritonitis, and that really doesn't get better on it. Respiratory anthrax, I haven't got any pictures for. This is the one that has the security people freaked out. Airborne spread. It's really quite infectious. 10 to 20,000 spores. Sounds a lot, but it's not really. It's sort of pinhead stuff. Ooh. And if untreated, it will kill about nine people out of ten. Ah, have you heard? I, mean, I, I started reading it, I never read it further. But actually, the plague of 1348 49 was actually anthrax. One of the problems with old records is that uses of terminology change and evolve. I mentioned, for example, that we don't know an awful lot about old, about old smallpox because it doesn't affect bones. So the, the old, it's not a fossil record, but the old archaeological records are not very useful to you. But one thing we do know is that there was no leprosy in the Middle East in biblical times. Although, you, you cannot open the Old Testament without a leper falling out somewhere. <laughs> so, whatever they had, that they were calling leprosy, it's not what we call leprosy. Mm. There's a lot of a lot of argument about what it was. If, well, 
I think the only thing everybody agrees on is it, it, it wasn't one disease. Lots of things will, will have been called leprosy. Um, one quite nice theory, theory I like is that the psoriasis was one of them. Because a lot of the things you hear, and so-and-so went and bathed in the pool of such and such and was cured. And there are a lot of sulfur springs, there are a lot of mineral springs that will make enormous differences to acute dermatological conditions. Same story about the, uh, the exiled Celtic prince who discovered the springs of Bath. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, Bath's bars are wonderful. Um, it's hard to die of a dermatological condition other than cancer. It can be done. If you get enough of your skin involved by an inflammatory condition like eczema, or psoriasis, you can lose control of the ability to regulate your body temperature. I've only seen this once as a very junior doctor, only about eight weeks qualified. We got a young lad in with, with literally head to toe eczema. Fortunately, I knew what to do. I asked sister. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And we ducked him in. And she said, "Ah, she said, right, yes, I, I've got the, uh, I've got the right bath bathroom." <laughs> she took me into the, into the, the ward bathroom, and there was this bath full of purple water. Is that really right bean? Potassium, potassium <laughs> Wonderful for drying up the wetness. <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh um, well, there's Melanie synergistic gangrene. I've seen a case of that. Uh, an elderly chap whose scrotum fell off. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, associated with, with chronic urinary tract infections. Uh, Fournier gangrene. There are ones. That they are nasty. Um, you're unlucky to die of them in that pretty radical resection of the skin and grafting. But it does tend to happen. It, it does tend to happen to occur in debilitated people who are not in a good way at the best of time. So the, the uh, mortality rate is higher than you might expect. Now anthrax has a great history as a weapon. The Germans used it against the Russians in Finland during the First World War. Uh, Japan tested it against prisoners of wars between the wars and before we get all high and mighty about the Russians the Germans and the Japanese and whatever, we experimented with it quite widely in the 1940s. Greenland Island, of Scotland, was deliberately contaminated by bombing it with anthrax in 1942 to see how well it worked, and it remained successfully contaminated for 50 years. Uh, to be honest, it remained contaminated until they raised the money to decontaminate. It could have been decontaminated earlier, but it just a job. But you can now go there. It was uh, a crime to land on Greenland for a long, long, long time. Um, and we apparently, I, don't, I didn't know this either until I started to look at this talk, we stockpiled infected cattle food to drop on Germany. Operation Vegetarian to give all their cattle and trucks. Well, we didn't do it. There was an enormous fuss in the 1990s when someone wanted to build a housing estate on the site of an old gelatine factory because of all the dead cattle and the anthrax spores and making them in the ground? Yeah, I can believe it. It's, it lives in the ground. The thing is, it, to be honest, if you went out to the ground of this hotel and had a good look, you would probably find some in the ground. It's not that rare an organism in the environment. But the sort of concentrations you would find in old gelatine factories, old leather tanners or whatever. Yeah. Pat, does this say, because Ulyssa, where she is, she gave me a lift to go pick up a friend from the railway station, which she probably got. There's a set of dermatological medical gloves sitting on a flower bed. You didn't actually leave them earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't possibly find <laughs> <laughs> There are international treaties against the production of bioweapons since the 1970s. But funnily enough, in 1979, about a million people were exposed to anthrax following a leak at a factory east of Moscow. Yeah. 90 of them got infected and 60 odd of them died. The Russians insist this was from eating contaminated meat. <laughs> and not a leak from their bioweapons factory. Although, finally, in 1992, Yeltsin came clean and said, yeah, we were doing well. And everybody went, yes, we can. <coughs> yes, yeah, not fooling anyone. 2001, the US Postal Service 
carried a load of anthrax spore containing envelopes to politicians, which you can understand, and newspapers, which is slightly older, but anyway. The Daily Mail. I'm just waiting on which we keep an answer of cured or given cancer. Yeah. Yeah. So they infected 22 people, a quarter of them died. And the US Postal Service now has biohazard protection systems at all its major transit points. And this is a picture that I did show yesterday. That guy on the top right there is an anthrax scanner. He's wafted waft it around over a packet, stick a needle in, take some air out of the inside, it will tell you if it's anthrax. What's that one? It's not a caterpillar, it looks like a caterpillar. It's a molecule. It's uh, vitamin D. Up in New Yorkshire we have a saying, couldn't stop a goat in a ginnel, or couldn't stop a pig in a passageway, I'll say. <laughs> which refers to family legs, rickets. A condition caused either by a deficiency of vitamin D or a deficiency in activity of vitamin D. So you either don't get enough in your diet, you don't make enough by exposure to sunlight, or in, in renal failure, the kidney doesn't do the final step in the chemical conversion to make vitamin D active. The name probably comes from the old Norse rickin, meaning bent or twisted. Um, adults do get vitamin D deficiency, but we call it osteomalacia there. Me, me, I heard it. How long have you been being, being treated? Um, well, I've been, once they told me that, once I had a blood test that said I had low vitamin D, yeah. I started taking the tablets. They still I'll, haven't. I'll, I'll, told I'll come me back about to it. vitamin D. <laughs> 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 in, uh, in babies, it tends to produce the, the bow leg, the, the goat McGill <laughs> appearance. Although in older children, it tends to produce not knees. Other way around. The bones and joints are often painful, presumably due to microfractures. The bone is soft and deformable uh, and microfractures. And you get some rather peculiar chest deformities, a thing called a rickety rosary, where, where the ribs, which are bone, meet the cartilage that joins them to the breastbone. You get inflammation and expansion of that area, and you get uh, nodules down the side of the sternum, hence the phrase the rickety rosary. And it reduces. Uh, pigeon chest and tunnel chest, which I'll come back to in a minute. And because it interferes with vitamin C, it produces, it interferes with muscle activity, it produces tetany, not tetanus, but you get spasms the same. Um, there's some interesting ways of testing, or well, not testing, nowadays, which takes some blood through the test. But uh, in, the old, in, in the olden days, if you tapped over somebody's facial nerve, if their calcium was low, they would, they would get a facial tick. Chostex sign. Crusoe sign or something so on. Oh, the cause of my right to be the cause. Here we go. Ah. Yeah. Bumble chest. To be frank, the books are a bit vague on precisely why some people get a funnel chest and some people get a pigeon chest and some people don't get either. So they say, yeah, well it's your air pressures, isn't it, Gov? But you can see this is this is quite impressive. Um, that the, the MRI scan possibly not so impressive. You can see that definitely what should be going out is going in. It is usually completely symptomless. Doesn't cause any problems at all, which is weird. You can see how, <coughs> see how it is. Uh, yes, uh, it's called uh, pes excavatum, or funnel chest, or dented chest. Oh. Doctors are really good at naming things. <laughs> yeah. The opposite, not a terribly good photograph, is this one, the pigeon's chest, where the breastbone pushes out like the keel bone on a, on a bird skeleton or for an uh, attachment to fly muscles. And again, it usually sometimes, the, these things are cosmetic and surgery is sometimes attempted, but it's pretty major surgery, mm -hmm. faffing around with somebody's room. Treatment is fairly obvious. You can give people vitamin D supplements. Um, you can educate people to get out of the sunshine a bit more. Don't cover your kids in factor a billion sunblock every time they go out the door. Get them off the PlayStation, active on once in a while. 
And you can supplement it either by giving people pills or food supplements. So chapati flour, for example, is routinely supplemented with vitamin D in that Asian populations don't make as good use of what sunlight we have in Britain, and ants are at risk. Now, over the last three or four years, five years, you can't pick up an episode of the BMJ without reading that somebody has discovered that patients with, insert your favorite disease here, have low vitamin D. And the suggestion was, low vitamin D causes this, low vitamin D causes that, low vitamin D causes all these other things. They've now discovered that when you get ill, for whatever reason, your blood vitamin D levels drop. So if you take somebody who's ill and measure their vitamin D, it is usually, well, it is more likely to be low than you would expect. So a lot of the things that they've confidently said vitamin D promotes this and the other, they're now having to backtrack on. Uh, and this is a, a medically invented condition. In some cases, not necessarily individuals. There is a similar syndrome. You see adverts in the papers you know, come for a checkup, come for a full body scan, arm, MRI scan, I will scan you top to toe. But if you do that in somebody who is perfectly healthy, you will find three or four small funny nodules somewhere. And you will then spend another thousand pounds x-raying them and probing them and testing them and even operating on them to get them out, and you will find they were nothing at all. Because what's happening is we don't have a lot of experience of doing extensive scans on large numbers of people. So we are seeing variations from normality that we're not used to, and over-investigating people, over-medicalizing, over diagnosis And it has its own terminology. It's called vomit syndrome. <laughs> Victim of medical imaging technology. <laughs> <laughs> So I think that's it. Uh, that's what I'm missing out, or we're all missing out on from having been born here in the future. <laughs> I've got to say, Pat, my next sick day, I'm going to have such an impressive thing to have done. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Borrow. delete. Borrow. <laughs> just just <laughs> read the thing. No, you've got hysteria. Borrow with a touch of the gleats. <laughs> I, think, I think that is it. I, I'm certain that is my last slide. <laughs> Yeah, that's my last slide. So, thank you all.